You said earlier one of the important questions is what happens in the afterlife. I can punt on that. I have no problem punting on that because I don't know, and I'm not going to let you threaten me with an afterlife. If I show up at the pearly dirty. gates, fine. If I show up at the pearly gates and God is there, I will say, sorry, I'm going to hell because I don't want any part of this. Right. You said. That's right. You said that Jesus rose from the grave. We have a word for that. It comes from Haitian Creole, I believe. It's called zombie. You worship a zombie. You accept a human sacrifice. You say that because Eve ate that apple, women have to suffer horribly in childbirth and are not allowed to enjoy sex because of that stupid one little thing that God dared her to do and had a serpent there to back it up. Okay, so at that point, Christ gave his life for our sins, right? That's a human sacrifice. And when you eat the wafer and drink the wine, you are eating your sacrifice, which is not the way the Hebrews did it. You're not supposed to do that, okay? So you're already violating the rules in your own book, asking people to worship a zombie and trust you that there are sky fairies who will make everything wrong for all the people who hurt us in our life. Now, if you want to do that, fine. I accept that. Science tells me one thing. Religion is kind of like a drug. Okay, a little pot is great. A lot of pot is too much. A little religion helps people and makes them feel better, gives them strength for life. That is great. A lot, a lot makes them go raping and pillaging through the countryside, murdering, stabbing and hewing, launching crusades to get the bullies out of Europe because they were busy raping and pillaging their own people and not, why not the Muslims? Because we didn't care about them. Acknowledge that if there is no God, you create your own purpose. And if my purpose is to love and respect her, that's great. But if tomorrow my purpose is to steal her backpack, that's great also, because everything's relative. But if there is a God who created her with value, then for me to steal her backpack is objectively, absolutely wrong. We grow, we live, and we decay if something else doesn't take us out. I don't know what happened. I'm not going to pretend that I know what happens when we die. I ain't never been dead. I don't even remember what it was like before I was living. But what I will say is I don't have any fear of it. I have no knowledge of it. And I really could care less. All right, then let me ask you. If Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler are in the same place, the fertilizer pit, then does it matter whether you're Adolf Hitler II or Mother Teresa II? See, the point is, if there is no life after death, then life is ultimately meaningless. Because it doesn't ultimately matter whether you're Mother Teresa the second or whether you're Adolf Hitler the second. It's an experience. Just because yeah. it doesn't necessarily exactly. happen in an afterlife. Exactly. So let Hitler have his experience. Let the KKK have their experience. Let Dr. Martin Luther King have his experience. But we're all going to the same place, the fertilizer pit, if there is no God, which means it's ultimately meaningless. No. It's not the beauty of life that there is no meaning. Like Thank you. Experience. There is no meaning to life if there is no God. But if there is a God who created us for a purpose, then there is meaning to life. And according to Christ, the purpose of life, the reason God created you and me, is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as yourself. That means your life is not an accident. You were made for a purpose. That's good news. Did you see? Now just be honest with yourself. What's motivating you, my atheist friend? Is it because you like to write the rules? If that's the reason that you're rejecting God, no, that's not you're not I being mean. very honest intellectually. That's not the reason. I, I really cannot rationalize it, okay? And when I try to rationalize it, all these conflicts that I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not, that doesn't make sense to me. So one of those is being a controlling God that tells you that you're going to go to hell. That
that's not appealing to me. I understand. But ma'am, wait a second, wait a second, wait, 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 wait a second. I, it's not appealing to me. Have you heard me say that? I didn't say that you said that. I do not find it appealing that God says I have to love all four of these people. I want to choose who I love. I want to choose who I respect. And if you give me a reason not to respect you, I don't want to respect you. Now I'm confronted by Jesus Christ who says, there is a God, Cliff, who created you to respect this woman regardless of her behavior. I don't like that. There's a God who says, I got to love Austin regardless of what Austin does to me. I don't like that. If Austin is nice to me, I want to love him. If he's mean to me, I want to write him off. That's what I want to do. And all of a sudden, I'm confronted by a God who says, no, Cliff, I'm sorry. I created you to love Austin regardless. That's unconditional love. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the heart of God who unconditionally loves you and me. So much so that when we flip God off, instead of just washing his hands and saying, good riddance, go to hell, instead he sent his only son Jesus to bleed and die on a cross to forgive us and to reconcile us to himself. Now that's amazing grace. And when you begin to understand the depth of God's unconditional, gracious love for you, that does a number on your head, as this lady was saying. So all I'm saying to you, ma'am, is please be open to God's grace. Please be open to God's love for you. Just because you live a certain way without God doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're a bad person. You can still be a proper, just, loving person right. without God. And that That's doesn't right. mean your life is meaningless because you don't believe in the afterlife. I, I feel understand. like if you don't believe in the afterlife, that gives the life you live right now more purpose Thank because you. you're living, you get to live it to the fullest. All right, good. Sir, no, 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 I'm going to respond to him first. You need to read the black author James Baldwin. James Baldwin, the black author, was brilliant. James Baldwin pointed out, why is racism wrong? And what James Baldwin did was, he poured scorn on white liberal intellectuals who love to run around saying, oh, racism is wrong because you're not enlightened. If you were enlightened, if you were as intelligent as me, you would realize that racism is wrong. And James Baldwin pointed out, you're a bunch of arrogant intellectual elitists. Why is racism wrong? Racism is not wrong because I'm a liberal, white, educated person. That is not why racism is wrong. Racism is wrong because you are a human being and I'm a human being created in the image of God. And racism is an attack on the innate value that God has given you. Racism is not wrong because I'm a white intellectual. And I have finally reasoned myself to the point of realizing, oh, racism is naughty. Big whoop, you white intellectual. That has nothing to do with why racism is wrong. Racism is wrong is because when you have a racist attitude, you are demeaning, degrading a human being created in the likeness of God. That's why racism is wrong. It's not wrong because I'm a white, enlightened intellectual who's gone to an Ivy League college. And so now I, from my intellectual superiority, define racism as being wrong. And if you base your life on your own thinking, your own intellect, you're exactly doing the same mistake that the intellectuals who James Baldwin attacked. Instead, if you're an honest atheist intellectual, you have to say, I've created my own moral system, but it's relative. It's my own bias. I've created my own meaning in life. And all of my atheist friends have created their own ethical system, and they've created their own meaning in life. But all of my honest atheist friends, intellectually honest, have to say, but that's just relative. It's just a taste of mine. And if I contradict tomorrow what I say I believe today and have good reason for it, that's fine. See, that's honesty. So it doesn't mean that we're less of a person, that our life is meaning because we don't believe in God. Okay. We still live in a proper manner. We okay, still good. can live like good people. Okay, now, all you got to do is study Dr. Martin Luther King. I have. Okay, I, good. I, yes. Then you know, you know that Dr. Martin Luther King confronted by the white ministers of Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Martin Luther King looked those white ministers in the face and said, you are not taking your Jesus seriously enough. You're not committed enough to your Christ. Because when you read the Gospels and when you read the Bible, you see that God hates racism. 
So Dr. Martin Luther King did not say to those white ministers in Birmingham, Alabama, turn away from Christ. Instead, he pointed his finger in their face and said, start taking the Jesus you say you believe in more seriously. And I agree 100% with what King said. I feel like there are a lot of people who can just, in this in the society especially, yes. there's a lot of people who can just flip open and find something and flip it to how they want to flip it. Yes, sir. Like Westboro Baptist Church. Yes, sir. The KKK. Yes, sir. They'll, they'll flip it and say, oh, white people are superior. Oh, God hates everybody. God hates all yep. of them. Yep. And I just don't agree with how people flip things. Good. We're the same, man. Just because a person says they're a Christian doesn't mean much of anything. Then you got to watch the way the person lives. And if they contradict Christ by the way they live, you know you got to look that person in the face and say, now what's going on here? Okay, now here's my final point to you, all right? And then we'll go on to somebody else. You know that I'm a follower of Christ, right? Okay, now I'm going to finish here in a little bit. If you watch me leave here and go out and womanize, try and sleep with as many women as I can, what are you going to call me? A hypocrite. A hypocrite, thank you. An adulterer, a hypocrite. Because I say I believe in Jesus, but then I contradict it. So my point to my atheist friends is, don't be an intellectual hypocrite. Don't say there is no God, morality is relative, but then live as if your relative morality is objectively true. That's all I'm saying. What's your stance on same sex? That's one of the points. On same sex? Yes, I'm straight. I'm just wondering, guys. You bet. Just <laughs> In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, we read a very positive statement about God's intention for sex. We read, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one. That is a very positive, very loving statement on why God created us male and female. So I guess what I'm saying is, do you think that they're going to go to hell or do you think they're going to go somewhere else? Because a couple of weeks ago, there was a guy here who was slandering and saying all kinds of things and people were booing him. And then just, that was just what he was saying. So I was wondering what you thought about that. You bet. Paul answers your question beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So what was true in the church in Corinth is true today. Adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, drunks, liars, slanders, sinners like me, stand under the judgment of a holy God. But Jesus Christ bled and died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin, your sin, all of our sin. But now we have to personally respond by asking Christ for forgiveness, by putting our faith in him, and by receiving that grace and that gift of eternal life. And one of my best friends in New York City lived in the gay community, and he practiced homosexual sex. He converted, he put his faith in Christ, and by the power of God's Holy Spirit, he lives a sexually pure life now. And a bunch of my friends are adulterers. But by the power of God and by the grace of Christ, they are not living in adultery any longer. They've changed. A bunch of my friends are slanderers and liars. But they've asked Christ for forgiveness, and by his grace, they are changing and becoming truth speakers. About slavery, I believe you said earlier that you, um, that you hate it, it shouldn't exist. So slavery's in the Bible, and isn't slavery right in some instances if you can get out and if you're like an indigenous servant and you can work your way to freedom? Okay, good. All right, now, sir, you've asked a very difficult question, a very good question. And you're going to have to do a lot of studying and a lot of thinking through this issue, especially in light of the fact that you're a black man living in a pretty white culture. Okay? First point. When Paul writes, 
Slaves, obey your master. He's addressing people who lived in the Roman Empire. Over 50% of people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Doctors were slaves, lawyers were slaves, business people were slaves, and all of them could buy their way out of that slavery. In fact, those slaves were really indentured servants. And it was due to economic situations that they were slaves, but they could buy their way out of that slavery. Now, other than the slaves in the Roman Empire, and please hear this loud and clear, were slaves because they were part of conquered nations. So we're totally aware of the fact that slavery in the Roman Empire had a lot to do with economics, but it also had a lot to do with conquered peoples were enslaved. Horrible. Now, Paul is coming in, and he's talking to a culture with over 50% slaves, most of whom are indentured servants, but some are result of being conquered. And he's saying, slaves, obey your masters. In other words, I'm calling you to respect your masters. But in the letter of Philemon, Paul writes to a slave owner named Philemon and says, accept your runaway slave Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. Paul is laying the foundation for the abolition of slavery. When I begin to realize that you are my brother in Christ, how dare I enslave you? But he's not calling for Spartacus to rise up and lead a major revolution in the Roman Empire, freeing it of slaves and slavery. Now, the reason that this issue is so hard for me as a white American and you as a black American to understand is, because in our culture, Slavery was based on race. It was a type of racism that was pathetic. But that is not what Paul is addressing. Slavery in the Roman Empire had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with economic station in life and whether you were part of a conquered nation. So if anybody says to you, oh, Paul and the Bible are supporting the type of slavery here in the United States that we had pathetically, they are totally wrong. He's not addressing a slavery based on race. Where is it at in the Bible so I can read upon it? You bet. Letter of Philemon, okay, Colossians, where Paul talks about slavery, and then Leviticus talks about slavery as well. Now, in Leviticus, it's different. In Leviticus, we've got legislation for the nation of Israel, and we also have moral law. And there's a difference between legislation for the nation of Israel and moral law. But that's a hard distinction to make because the two are mixed together there in Leviticus. All you got to do is turn to John chapter 8, where Jesus is confronted by men who want to stone a woman caught in the act of adultery, which is right out of Leviticus. Jesus says, no, the one among you who's never committed a sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And he's clearly pointing to the fact that many of the Levitical laws, which applied to the theocracy, the nation of Israel, did not apply living in a Roman Empire. Which ones? Like stoning the adulteress. Okay, which other ones? Laws about the Sabbath. Okay, so does he actually list the ones? Does he have a guide no. to which parts of the Old Testament are still valid and which ones we have to ignore? No. Then how are we supposed to use the Bible as law? By turning to Acts chapter 15, the first council of the church dealt with this very issue. The issue was, how Jewish does a Gentile Christian have to become? That was exactly the first issue. You're saying that, so one can look at America and say that all of us mostly are going to be slaves to this system in America because we're going to be slaves to a wage. We're going to be slaves to this. We can't just do anything we want because we're going to be slaves. We're going to be hold, held as slaves to the wage to live our life here. So that's, that's one thing that you're saying. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, understand your culture. Our culture understands slavery to mean the type of slavery we had here in America, which was based on race, right? All right, the slavery of the Roman Empire was not based on race. Based on ownership. 
So it's based on finances on? and conquered people. So I'm saying, can't one look at America and look and say that that's how ours is today now because we're based on wages and making this type of money to live this type of lifestyle and then if we stop working and don't do anything then we're gonna just you know die well, we don't we don't yeah we don't have this system no no i'm saying though since we all came here to get a degree to open our minds to learn yeah. more and then we're gonna go out get a job and we'll be held by wages held by money held by our bosses to make money so i'm saying isn't ours in a way financially set up like that well I don't know, but what I do find fascinating is a lot of those Levitical laws, like stoning a rebellious son. See, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. You and I have a police force and a prison system that did not exist 3,000 years ago in Israel. Instead, you are responsible that if your son starts whooping up on people, he's going to be stoned. So, you see, that was a legislative law for the nation of Israel. Now, we don't do that today in our culture, do we? Instead, if your son really does horrible things, he's going to end up in prison because the police will come and arrest him. That's our form of government. That was not the form of government 3,000 years ago in Israel. So, you don't stone your son because there's a way of dealing with disorderly conduct in the United States. Expectations are funny things. When they're realistic, they bring great joy to us as we look forward with delight to something good and positive in the future. But when they're unrealistic, when they're out of proportion, they can be horrendous. For unmet expectations usually lead to profound heartache and disappointment. That's true of our relationship with God. God called the Hebrew prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and warn them of impending judgment. But Jonah didn't want to, because Jonah wanted God to judge the Ninevites, to judge the Assyrians for their evil, wicked deeds. So Jonah went down to the seaport of Joppa, and he took a boat in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He went towards Tarshish. But after a very close encounter with a very large fish, Jonah reconsidered. He repented. He repented for running away from God. And he turned around and he went to Nineveh. And there he preached, repent, otherwise God will judge you. And to Jonah's horror, the people repented. The reason I say horror is because Jonah, as a good Jew, understood that the Assyrians had persecuted, slaughtered many, many people. Jonah wanted God to judge the Ninevites. He wanted fire to fall on that city. But instead, after preaching and going out and sitting in the countryside, waiting for judgment to fall on Nineveh, Jonah begins to realize God has forgiven them. God is being gracious to them. And in the last chapter of the book of Jonah, we read that Jonah was angry with God. God, I thought you were just. I expected you to judge those evil, wicked Assyrians, for they have wreaked havoc. They have perpetrated injustice. They have done grotesque evil and wickedness to countless numbers of people. And instead, God, you forgive them because they repent? Jonah was grappling with his expectations of God's judgment of the Assyrians. And instead of God's judgment, they got God's mercy and forgiveness. And Jonah was irate. You and I face the cha same challenge. ISIS, terrorists strike Paris, France. Over a hundred people are killed. Hundreds are wounded. What grotesque evil that a bunch of terrorists should slaughter innocent people. And yet the amazing truth is that God is just, which means he will judge all of us for the wrong that we have done, beginning with me. For I have done evil, I am a sinner. I deserve God's judgment, but on the cross Jesus Christ took the judgment that I deserve, thereby offering me forgiveness. But it's easy for me to get self-righteous. It's easy for me to look down on people, be it ISIS, be it people who are into child sex traffic trade, be it murderers. I can look down on other people as inferior losers. 
In reality, we all have rebelled against God. That is why we all are in desperate need of God's grace. Eugene O'Neill put it magnificently when he wrote, We're all born broken. Life is about healing. The grace of God is the glue. Have you accepted God's grace? Yes, it's a deep, unpredictable grace. Jonah learned that as he sat outside the city of Nineveh, expecting the wrath of God to fall on that city. Instead, they got the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, because they repented. They asked for forgiveness. God is not a cartoon figure, one-dimensional. He's complex. He's just, and He's also merciful and forgiving. And the justice and mercy of God come together magnificently at the cross of Christ. It's painful, it's bloody, and there's death involved. But it's also sacrificial death. It's Christ laying down His life for you and for me, taking the just penalty for our wrongdoing, thereby offering us forgiveness and life eternal. Have you accepted Christ? Have you put your faith in Him? Do you have realistic expectations of God? He promises to forgive all those who trust Him. He promises that when you put your faith in Him, He will never leave you. God promises that in the most difficult circumstances of your life, He will be at work when you trust Him, when you seek to follow Him. He promises that when you put your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, He gives you eternal life in heaven. Those are realistic expectations. Those are expectations that the Bible calls hope, which is a confident expectation of good based on the promises of God, not based on naivete, not based on blind optimism, a confident expectation of good based on the promises of God. Do you have that hope? You can't live without it, really. Because if you don't have Christ in your life, if you don't know God, then despair is the logical conclusion. The amazing message of Christ is that in spite of all the evil and injustice in this world, in spite of the fact of death, God has defeated death and will ultimately defeat all evil, and there will be eternal life in heaven. Do you know this God, who loves you more deeply than you ever could have dreamed of? Do you know Jesus Christ? Right now, put your faith in Christ in your own unique, personal way. God bless you as you make that decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30. We meet at Grace Farms, which is located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. We also have a 5 to 5.30 short service every Sunday afternoon. I'd love to invite you to join us this Sunday for the 9.30 or 5 p.m. service. Thanks for spending these few minutes with us. Have a great day.